Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Venkat Gopalan from Material Science. Uh, Uli and Fong Hanel and I, uh, we are very happy to organize the MADC celebration of Hispanic and Latinx scientists and inventors. Um, we have in our department uh, been very active uh, in the last year or so, uh, uh, led by Enrique Gomez. We've been celebrating Asian and Pacific Highlander scientists. Uh, we have celebrated black scientists, African-American scientists, and women scientists. And today we are gonna celebrate Hispanic and Latinx scientists. So our first speaker is uh, Julian Fong Hanel, and I'll let him take the floor. Thank you, Venka. Um, so today, my, the first person I'm gonna be talking about <clears throat> is uh, Dr. Rafael Navarro Gonzalez. Uh, Dr. Navarro got his BS in biology from the University of UNAM, and he later went to get his PhD in chemistry from the University of Maryland. Uh, this interdisciplinary training positioned him in a prime spot to develop the area of astrobiology for which he is world renowned. He has received many awards, such as the Alexander von Humboldt Medal, the World Academy of Sciences Award in Earth Sciences, and he has been the first recipient of the Molina Fellowship. A few of his titular contributions to science are his discoveries of the role of volcanic lightning on the creation of the fundamental blocks of light, and the origin of life on Earth. He was also a member of the NASA's Curiosity rover, where he developed the sample analysis at Mars, or the SAM analyzer, which carries the instrumentation necessary to make assertion of the possibility of life on Mars. Unfortunately, Dr. Navarro passed away earlier this year due to COVID complications. In his honor, NASA actually named a mountain on Mars after him. You can see it depicted uh, in the image above, and it's currently where a Curiosity rover is positioned at, or at least you can see the mountain from where he is now. Finally, I just want to mention that as a teacher, he further entrenched in me a passion for science, space, and interdisciplinary, in this interdisciplinary knowledge when I took his astrobiology course in my undergrad years. So he is a very personal, uh, a very personable, uh, personal uh, hero of mine. Additionally, um, continuing with the theme of space and with my shirt, um, I will be talking about uh, Dr. Elena Ochoa, the first Hispanic American astronaut um, who was um, who was for, who her who her who his whose first mission was in the shuttle Discovery. Though retired from space work, she has logged over a thousand hours in space. She is also the first Hispanic and second female director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. She got her BS in physics at the University of San Diego State University and got her master's and PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford. As if these recognitions were not enough, what I most admire about Dr. Ochoa was the leadership tactics that she used while being director at NASA. Here she implemented a culture of nonconformity and of psychological safety. This means that she implemented a culture where people were free to rethink and question base assumptions without backlash or repercussion, where she normalized vulnerabilities and implemented strategies to fix them. NASA's previous informal motto before, uh, before her used to be, in God we trust, everyone else brings data which caused a lot of hesitancy and restraints on people to question authority and previous modes of best practices. These antiquated assumptions led to several disasters like the Columbia and the Challenger disasters, which killed 14 astronauts. Um, where, where doubts were not taken seriously due to the lack of evidence. Once Ochoa started her work as a director, the opposite has been true. And instead, people have to prove that safety is an actual thing. Finally, as a cherry on top, she's also a fantastic classical flutist. Lastly, um, but not least, I would like to briefly mention Dr. Maria Antonieta Cervantes, AKA my grandmother. My grandma is an archeologist and an anthropologist. And she has been president of the Mexican Academy of Anthropological Sciences 
and is currently a food and Mesoamerican culture researcher at the National Institute of Anthropology and History, and has been one of the first people to enter major archaeological sites. One of the examples is depicted above on the right, uh, where she got me and my girlfriend, also the, my ex-girlfriend, uh, depicted there, um, to uh, one of the tunnels discovered in 2016 in Teotihuacan. We were among the first 50 people to see these ruins in the last 2,000 years. Even though you may not consider her work, you, even though you may consider her work as uh, social sciences, I know there's a lot of things that you might be familiar with. In one of her works, she worked with researchers at the Materials Research Institute in UNAM to do isotopical analysis of teeth to determine the dietary constitutions of Mesoamerican diet uh, using remains found in archaeological sites. She also studied the effects of the process of nixtamalización, which is a chemical treatment of the polymerized corn grain used to make tortillas, um, where it's soaked in basic ash. Uh, this is a tactic that Mesoamericans learned to improve the nutritional qualities of tortillas. So these are three of my uh, personal uh, Hispanic and Latino uh, heroes, and I would just uh, like to thank you for your attendance and your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, that was wonderful, and thank you for uh, telling us about your grandmother, Dr. Cervantes. Um, Next is Mauricio Terrones on uh, Rafael Reef. Yeah, uh, thanks, thank you. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Rafael Reif. So he's Leo Rafael Reif, and then he's currently the president of MIT. Uh, but actually, it's very interesting to see his career because he started as electrical engineer and in Venezuela, and then he moved uh, to the US. So he did his first degree, uh, his bachelor's degree in Carbobo, Venezuela. And, uh, and after that, he did a master's and a PhD at Stanford University. Uh, then uh, that was in 1973, that's when he finished his first degree in Venezuela. Then actually it's very interesting in 73 to 74, he was assistant professor at University Simon Bolivar in Venezuela. And then he moved to, he started then his PhD, his master's in Stanford in 1975. Uh, he finished his PhD in 1979 at, at Stanford as well. And, uh, but he was a visiting assistant professor in, at Stanford in that period of time when, when he was finishing his PhD. Then he got a position as assistant professor in 1980, so soon after he finished his PhD and at MIT. And since then, he was, he's been at MIT since then. So he's been assistant professor, associate professor, full professor. And in 1990, he was the director of the Microsystems uh, Tech Laboratory. And from 1999 to 2004, he was the associate deputy head uh, in electrical engineering at MIT. So he was there five years where he served as uh, associate department head. Then in 2004, only for one year, he became department head of electrical engineering engineering at MIT. And then in 2005, he became the provost of MIT. And he was there for five, for seven years. Actually, I had the opportunity to meet him. And he's a very, very pleasant person. He was provost of, of MIT. And it was nice because we sort of encountered, we started speaking Spanish. And, and actually, it was we exchanged some, uh, yeah, some conversations. And it was a nice, nice, nice chat with him. Uh, then in 2012, he became the president of MIT, uh, but in, during his career, and I will tell you about in the, in the next slide, but he has supervised 38 PhD students, right? So he was, when, when he served as a, as a faculty member, he was yeah, fully engaged in that. So the next slide shows uh, uh, the awards that he has gotten. So in 1980 to 1982, he was IBM, uh, he got a fellowship, the IBM faculty fellowship at MIT. So soon after he moved to MIT, uh, in 1984, he, he got the US Presidential Young Investigator Award. Uh, he became fellow of the IEEE in 1993. And actually it was because of his pioneering work on low temperature epitaxial growth of semiconductor thin films. And that's interesting to see, right? So he was, he was working on thin film growth and, and, and he, was, he was doing pretty well as a scientist. 
She's member of the National Academy of Engineering. He's fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. He's member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's fellow of, Na of Chinese Academy of Engineering as well. In 2000, he got the Aristotle Award, which was given to his contribution to the semiconductor science. And in 2018, when he was president, when he was president at, at MIT, uh, he was named the engineer, engineer of the year. Uh, he has gotten different honorary doctorates, uh, but I think what he's, it, he's now developing at MIT as president, and of course he had the opportunity to see how things work as provost, is that he's, uh, he started promoting this tough tech uh, science uh, in 2015, but that sort of, uh, because he wanted to provide space mentorship and bridge funding to uh, for entrepreneurs, uh, just to to move the science or the fundamental science into wearable in workable products. And that became the basis of the project is called the engine, the accelerator uh, at MIT and has been very, very successful. So some of the things that he has done in, in the uh, at MIT as president, he has done different things and he has some vision of how things, I mean, where things are moving and long before, uh, yeah. Uh, so for example, then uh, for regarding higher education, uh, he is trying to really redefine uh, the future of higher education. And that was something that he started when he became president, that's something he really wanted to move forward. And he wants, you know, the commitment to advance diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, as I mentioned, he's supporting in 2016, then he, they launched, MIT launched the engine uh, about this venture uh, uh, firm that especially the idea is just to uh, help innovators and also try to help humanity with the greatest challenges. In terms of these greatest challenges, he also foresaw that uh, artificial intelligence uh, was important. And in 2018, MIT launched this, uh, the, the Abdul Latif Jamel Clinic for machine learning and health. And it was in 2018 when he, they wanted to say, okay, how can we use machine learning to revolutionize prevention, detection and treatment of disease? And this is something that is currently, we're, we're facing that now. Uh, he's also engaged with environmental climate, uh, environmental and climate solutions, and also in, in 2004 he launched the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative, and again uh, another uh, center laboratory the, uh, related to the water and food security. So uh, and he's really you know committed to climate change, and he's trying to get you know researchers, students, faculty. Uh, to, to have breakthroughs uh, so that climate change and innovators can move in this area. So uh, with that, I finish my... So I think it, it's, it's, a nice, it's nice to have to see uh, someone who came to the US and as a you know, student and all the way, he's now president of MIT. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauricio. That was very inspiring. Uh, thank you for uh, telling us about uh, Professor Rafael Reef. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Enrique Gomez, and he's going to tell us about Monica Olvera de la Cruz. Thank you, Venka. It's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about Monica. She was born in Acapulco, Mexico. She had a bachelor's uh, in physics from um, the National Autonomous University of Mexico and then did her PhD at Cambridge, also in physics, actually working with uh, Sir Sam Edwards. And then from there, um, you know, went on to be a faculty member at Northwestern where she's been in since 1986. And Monica is very well known in the field of soft matter um, and in particular her, in her expertise of soft matter theory. And she's been recognized as a member of the National Academy of Science. I'm actually gonna start in a little bit more of a personal note. Um, I've met Monica a few times She's a wonderful person, always very supportive to young faculty and always trying to reach out and see to what extent she can support and help people, despite the fact that she's incredibly busy because she's um, director of all kinds of centers, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. So it's really a pleasure to highlight Monica's accomplishments and tell you a little bit about her work, um, given that not only is she an awesome scientist, but she's an awesome person. All right, next, please. 
All right. So she, as I mentioned, Monica is an expert on soft matter theory. She's well known as one of the great minds in kind of uh, polymer science and soft matter science, uh, in particular in terms of kind of theoretical concepts and simulations. Uh, there's a there's a very selected few awards on the left because her list is just remarkable. Um, you know, she's a member of the American Philo Philosophical Society. She won the uh, APS American Physical Society Palmer Physics Prize. As I mentioned, National Academy of Engineering, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, she's been a fellow. She won a Presidential Young Investor Award as well as a, a Packard um, Fellowship um, when she was just starting her career. And in general, what her work, uh, or some of the things that she's known for is basically for developing models of molecular electrolytes to basically understand how charge systems um, behave and how they how they uh, affect in terms of phase behavior as well as um, you know dynamics and so on. And this was. Uh, something that she's been working for some time. The thing to remember about this problem is that because of the long range interactions of charged systems, that has made simulations particularly tricky, right? So it makes computational methods really slow. So you have to be really clever in figuring out how you treat those charged systems, especially back when we had less computing power. And that's kind of been her hallmark of her work. It's just an incredible cleverness and insightfulness on how to basically tackle these tough problems and come up with, with things that over, over time have demonstrated to be quite true. So she's done a lot of work on self-assembly, uh, in particular with this in, in, in non-charged systems as well, but in particular with the part where she's really um, has um, really few comparisons is that of charged systems, um, because she's tackled these tough problems um, in ways that others haven't been able to. So an example is, is like this phase diagram, basically what happens, um, for those of you who know a little bit about block of polymer science, on the left is the interaction, the bottom is volume fraction. Um, and essentially you see this kind of upside down U phase behavior, which you might recognize from various phase diagrams. And she can basically show how adding a little bit of charge completely changes. So if, if you take nothing else from that little graph, it's just that the black goes from to, to green when you put a little bit of charges in and she's the person that's really been able to develop those types of concepts. Okay, next slide, please. And so one of the, this is one of my favorite papers that she's done from some time ago. Uh, a, a while back, there was this um, kind of bit of a uh, conundrum that people were thinking about is that folks know that polyelectrolytes, because they're charged, those ionic interactions tend to repel each other. As a consequence, polyelectrolytes tend to be very stiff and extended, kind of like little rods. And so an example of that is DNA. However, right, nature knows how to collapse DNA into little tiny packets, right, so they can basically be stuck nicely and compact inside of cells. Otherwise, if these long rods, there's no way that, you know, biology would exist, that any of us would exist. And this has been kind of like a puzzle for a long time. How is that possible? And so, so Monica was really a pioneer in terms of thinking about, well, what is, how is this possible? And what she showed is essentially that um, with some amount of counter-iron condensation, you can neutralize the charge enough so that the chain becomes flexible and can compact. And in particular, if you have some multivalent, a small concentration of multivalent ions, that can be really important to kind of promote that collapse and allow for essentially um, uh, interactions to, 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 to basically so that the ionic interactions don't dominate the chain conformation. And in that way, basically allow things like DNA to be tightly packed, okay? So I believe that's it. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of her work and uh, the fact that um, she's not only a kind of titan in soft matter theory, but she's also um, a remarkable um, and supportive person, and it's been my pleasure to highlight Monica. Great. Thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, I have known Monica, and I totally agree with you. She is brilliant, and she's extremely nice. Uh, we have superstars of our own. The next speaker, Joshua Robinson, is going to highlight Mauricio Terones. Yeah, so I feel uh, uh, very privileged to be able to, uh, to, to highlight Mauricio. Um, he's sitting right here. He just gave, gave a, a highlight of his own. Um, so Mauricio is, uh, is a professor here in physics, chemistry, and material science and engineering. Uh, he has been quite busy since he got here um, in uh, 2013, I believe it was, um, or 12. Um, and... Uh, so he's uh, founder and director of the Center for Two-Dimensional Layer Materials, as well as director for the Center for Atomically Thin Multifunctional Coatings. 
So based just on those titles, you should be able to know or, or uh, infer that he is he's a leader in low dimensional and two dimensional materials. Um, and that really is his uh, his claim to fame there. And you can see him in all sorts of different pictures, including uh, what appears to be almost a superhero picture there on the left. <laughs> um, so next slide, please. So, so he's also a human being. He really enjoyed, you know, I, because um, I consider Mauricio a, a friend and a mentor, um, I was able to leverage a few pictures from him um, to, to show him off as, as someone that does enjoy time with his family and his cooking. So I wanted to, uh, to highlight that as well, to, to give the, uh, the human as opposed to the, uh, the superstar scientist side of him. So here he is with the family and then making pizza with his, his daughter a few years back, I suppose. So next slide. So Mauricio was born in Mexico City. Um, he did his, his BS in Mexico City, he got his bachelor's of science in physics and uh, physics engineering, I believe, right? And he, uh, he actually was ranked, um, I believe, the, first, the number one student um, in Mexico at that point. Um, and apparently, regardless of, of uh, how well he did, he couldn't get a company to hire him as a student. So he ended up going off to do his PhD. Uh, this is a picture of him in 1990 there up front, um, all smiles like he is uh, usually when I see him. Uh, and uh, uh, because he, he couldn't get that job, he ended up going uh, to do his PhD with Harry Croto, who uh, happens to be a Nobel laureate. Uh, so if you go to the next slide here, one more. Uh, and uh, he, so he went from undergrad in physics to a PhD in chemical physics uh, with, with Harry Croto. Um, and again, there's a picture of him on the right, eating some spicy food in Mexico with his brother, Umberto. Um, and uh, of course this was, was off of, of uh, Croto's website. Um, and following his PhD, what he did was go to Germany. So if you go next. Um, he got a Humboldt uh, fellowship uh, to, uh, to study material science um, you know, with uh, uh, TEM. So he went from physics to chemistry to material science. And it's kind of all come back around because now he is a professor in physics and chemistry and material science here at Penn State. So after his, his Humboldt fellow, so you go to the next slide, he went to uh, back to Mexico um, to, uh, to be a faculty member there. I was there for a while, um, focusing on uh, uh, carbon nanotubes and starting with graphene, and then left to go spend some time in Spain and in Japan, um, of which he still has has some connections. Um, and after Japan, he came here to Penn State. So next slide. Next slide. So so. This is uh, his group here at Penn State and a quick shot of his Google Scholar just to show that he's an extraordinarily productive uh, faculty member here at Penn State, really is a superstar among the superstars here, um, highly cited uh, for many years in a row now, and I'm sure it's going to continue. Uh, again, really focused on, on advancing our knowledge in nanosciences, um, is uh, very highly collaborative and uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, and I've only heard good things from his students. So why don't we go to the next slide. He is the recipient of a ridiculous number of awards as well, um, some of which are, are listed here. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, the Humboldt, as I mentioned, a National Prize for Chemistry from Mexico, um, you know, uh, Albert Einstein medal um, from UNESCO is a fellow in the AAAS, um, and the, the, the list uh, continues to go on, um, but I don't want to embarrass him, him too much. So I'm going to end with one more slide, I believe it is. He really is an inspiration, um, especially for me. He is extraordinarily accomplished, um, but he's also kind, he's humble, he's funny. And he really does see the best in people and he's an absolute wonderful mentor. Um, so I would like to th say, I'm one of the few people that could probably say directly to someone we're presenting here. Uh, Professor Trones, thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you, Josh, that was wonderful. And uh, I loved seeing the younger Terones in his pictures, <laughs> beautiful. Um, next we have, uh, Maria Higgins, uh, she's going to speak uh, on Mario J. Molina. 
Good morning, everyone. And um, thanks to the colleagues that put together this webinar. Uh, my name is actually Maria Molina Higgins, and I'm going to talk about Mario Molina. And he is known as the chemist that um, is a chemist, and he's also known as the Mexican immigrant that saved the world. Next slide, please. So the most notable work from Dr. Molina is the demonstrations that uh, CFC gases, you know, the damage that they cause to the ozone layer. So Dr. Molina has been the only Latin American Nobel Prize. And therefore I remember reading about him when I was in elementary school and in middle school in the nineties and two thousands. And since we do share similar names at the time, it made me believe that someone like me some child in, you know, uh, lost town in Latin America could also make discoveries that maybe could help humanity. Um, but going back to the uh, Dr. Molina's words, he and his advisor, um, Dr. Professor Sherwood Rowland, realized that without the protective ozone layers, there was going to be an increase in the ultraviolet radiation, which will impact the health of humans and also other living organisms. Next slide, please. Um, something that I like when I was researching him is that he mentions the importance of role models. Uh, so growing up for him was his aunt, which was the only scientist in the family. Uh, she was a chemist, Esther Molina. Um, and she recommended to the family to send Mario to Switzerland when he was 11 years old. But then I quote, he was very surprised and disappointed that his European schoolmates had no more interest in science than his Mexican friends. Next slide, please. So um, about his career, he studied chemical uh, engineering in La Universidad Autónoma de Mexico, UNAM. Uh, and then he went to Germany and pursued uh, studies in uh, kinetics of polymerizations. However, when he was there, he felt like this was not the topic that he wanted to pursue and realized that he needed to get a better understanding of basic subjects such as mathematics. So then he decided to go to Paris and study math on his own uh, with the friends that he had there. Um, after he was in Paris, then he returns to Mexico as an assistant professor and created the first graduate program in chemical engineering in the country. Uh, and then he was sort of a, like a, an activist. So, and Berkeley was apparently the best place for that. So he went back to grad school and studied physical chemistry in the University of Berkeley. Uh, and then in the picture, you can see him with his uh, advisor. Next slide, please. And so when both uh, Dr. Molina and Dr. Roland point out that a single a chlorine atom uh, will most likely negative impact uh, 100,000 ozone uh, molecules in the uh, a stratosphere, then he actually got a lot of pushback. So they were discredited by the chemical industry and the press, but uh, you know, further the studies um, confirmed that he was right. And it took 30 years to create a protocol that banned these substances from the industry. Um, Something that is interesting uh, about Dr. Molina is that he was not only a scientist, but in order to make changes, uh, he needed to be involved with policy. And so he actually got immersed in politics, which is something that a lot of scientists don't like to participate, myself included. Um, and something that is very interesting is like nowadays, there is a lot of comparison about the ozone crisis, the way that the ozone crisis once handled versus how the climate crisis is being handled like right now. Um, and so experts believe that the ozone layer campaign was more effective because uh, in this case, uh, people were told what to do. However, but fighting a you know, climate crisis, people are just bombarded with intimidating images about what will happen. And so people don't tend to act as fast. And then next slide. So uh, uh, to end this presentation, Dr. Molina died uh, on October, 2020. And I want you to leave you with one of the phrases. Um, we started something that was very important precedent. People can make decisions and, glo and solve global problems. Let's hope that the ocean layer issue was not the only problem that we globally solve. 
uh, with the help of not only scientists, but companies, activists, politicians, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. That was truly inspiring. Um, we have uh, our next speaker, Michael Hickner, and he's going to talk about Enrique Gomez, another superstar among us. Great. Thanks, thanks, Venkat. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's my pleasure to talk about Enrique and his work. Uh, and I believe Enrique is sitting in the next office. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a great privilege for me. So uh, Enrique hails from the University of Florida, where he got his uh, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. And then he went to the University of California at Berkeley to get a PhD in chemical engineering in soft matter. And Enrique uh, learned a lot about TEM uh, on his way uh, through Berkeley. He's one of the experts in soft matter TEM. Uh, but Berkeley is a really interesting place because they also have a world-class x-ray facility there. And so I encourage you to take a look at Enrique's website uh, shown here below because Enrique has really developed a special mixture of characterization, synthesis, modeling insight, and really having the scientific courage to uh, do physical science on systems that are really difficult, like cellulose, like composites, like water treatment membranes. And so I think, you know, even though Enrique and I came in together and uh, started together here at Penn State, I really look up to his science because of his willingness to do things rigorously, but also to take some really big chances uh, on important problems. And so uh, I was just uh, checking out his website over the last couple of days. Uh, and it's, it's really fascinating the different systems he's worked on. So I, I would encourage you uh, to take a look at that. So uh, Enrique uh, also uh, uh, likes to wear bow ties, at least in formal pictures. I think he's uh, told me that. And Enrique also has deep roots in Peru. Um, and so if you need uh, recommendations on the best Peruvian chicken within uh, you know, a significant radius of State College, I think Enrique has some uh, opinions uh, on that as well. So uh, next slide. So Enrique has had a, a real couple of highlights in the last few years, and, and I'm gonna give you a flavor of those highlights here, but then I wanna talk about a contribution that he made um, that I really identify with. Uh, but first of all, um, Enrique has done some groundbreaking work on reverse osmosis membranes and these types of membranes were discovered in the 1970s. Um, they're really useful materials. This is uh, the number one way that uh, drinking water for human consumption is made from the ocean. And so membranes just like this uh, are used to treat 95 million meters cubed of water per day, which is a lot of water and a lot of people. And more and more, we're gonna rely on reverse osmosis in this exact membrane technology for uh, clean water in the future. Now, what's weird about these membranes is that they were developed in an industrial lab for the purpose of treating water. And no one really knew how they worked that well. And no one really knew their nanoscale structure uh, until Enrique's team came along and really answered a critical question in terms of uh, how the heck do these uh, useful materials work. And so uh, you can see the um, blue and the uh, grayish green uh, images here. That's uh, depicting a rough surface of these RO membranes. And there were lots of hypotheses and guesses and wild speculation about roughness and the role of roughness in these membranes working, but there wasn't any definitive science that uh, pointed to a mechanism. But in the uh, PNAS work, and also uh, later in the science work, really the PNAS was shocking because Enrique was able to find these pockets of material inside the roughness. So using his skills in TEM and especially TEM tomography, you can see on the um, uh, bottom images there highlighted in pink and gray that there are these holes or these pockets inside these RO membranes. And that has a real 
function in terms of how these membranes purify water. So that was a real breakthrough. No one had ever seen these pockets. People had seen roughness. There are lots of guesses, but this was something uh, that I think was really insightful for the whole community and could only have been done by Enrique, who knows exactly what he's doing with TEM uh, and applying it to a hard problem. And so that work was extended in the science paper that was on the cover at the beginning uh, of this year. I think it showed up on uh, maybe New Year's Eve, Enrique, or uh, January 1st. So it was really cool um, that that pops up in your scientific alerts uh, right at the beginning of the year. Um, but now using TEM and figuring out the structure with all these pockets in the RO active layer, so you can see a cross-sectional image in that rainbow plot in the center labeled D, Enrique's team was able to now model the water transport through this really heterogeneous material. And that's the streamlines uh, labeled in panel C. So you can see the water, how it would flow through this real uh, nanostructured material. Uh, and again, this is just really uh, uh, important insight into the function of these materials and even though these materials have been around and, and made in square kilometers by Film Tech and Dow and DuPont, no one had ever done this uh, until Enrique came on the scene and started working in this area. So that's very cool. And we all know that clean water is an important problem. Next slide. However, more important than clean water perhaps is energy, uh, because if you have energy, you can, uh, cheap energy, you can use that to make clean water. And so this work uh, is from Enrique's uh, scientific start at Penn State. But this was really interesting to me because there was a lot of work on organic photovoltaics or making photovoltaic cells out of organic materials. So they only contain carbon, hydrogen, sulfur, maybe a little bit of nitrogen. And those elements are certainly in... Uh, uh, large abundance. And so if you can make photovoltaic devices out of polymers, uh, you can really do interesting things with photovoltaics without affecting the issues of critical materials or toxic materials, et cetera. Um, but this work was uh, re really illustrative of Enrique's approach to using polymer science, using TEM, and really figuring out the mechanistic aspects of how these systems work. And so organic photovoltaics are composed in general of polymer, and I show that on the top as P3HT, and in this case, a small molecule fullerene or modified fullerene, which is called PCBM. And what Enrique figured out in this macromolecules and PRL uh, series of work is that he was able to use high-end transmission electron microscopy to figure out where the sulfur is, because the polymer has sulfur on it, and that's in the uh, upper right-hand corner. And then Enrique mapped out the phase diagram for these two components, because of course, they, you get some phase separation that's not a miscible system over the whole composition range. And so that's interesting. People had uh, sort of guessed that um, uh, immiscibility was important. And of course, there were lots of, lots of uh, hypotheses on how this worked. Um, but until Enrique came along and really educated the community on how miscibility works, and that's shown in the mobility uh, plot versus volume fraction of PCBM in the uh, uh, lower right-hand panel, it's really this fine balance. And Enrique showed it's this fine balance of immiscibility, but getting the phase diagram right in the right spot in order to get high mobility. So of course, uh, part of the equation for high-end photovoltaics is you get high mobility of electrons. And Enrique was really able to tease out the mechanistic uh, aspects of where you want that miscibility, immiscibility window to be, and how you analyze problems like this uh, in a more sophisticated way, other than through percolation or through domain size or the other things that folks have done. So anyway, uh, I hope that uh, you've seen a couple of interesting examples of Enrique's work. And, and again, go look at his webpage. It's really awesome from you know, studies on cellulose to studies on cold sintering. You know, I think that um, uh, what I said previously 
Uh, Enrique is just a, a model for interdisciplinary science and how to attack hard problems uh, using uh, uh, you know, the tools that we have at our disposal. So uh, thank you very much. And thanks to Enrique as well uh, for uh, giving this to us uh, so we can uh, discuss it. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and, I, and I should also thank Enrique for being the director of our diversity, equity, inclusiveness. I always find him very uh, inspiring and informative. I always learn something from him when he speaks. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Javier Mena Garcia, uh, uh, going to speak on Evangelina Villegas. Hello, thank you. Yeah, so here uh, I am to talk to you a little bit about uh, Dr. Evangelina Villegas. Uh, she was born in Mexico in 1924, and then she uh, studied a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and Biology at the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico. Uh, that's, that's something very special because she did at a time, uh, she did that at a time where higher education for women was still a novelty. After that, uh, she came to the U.S. to study a master's of science in serial technology from Kansas State University. And then she got a PhD in serial chemistry and breeding from North Dakota State University. After studying here uh, in the U.S., she went back to Mexico, and in 1967, she started working in the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center in Mexico, where she formed a very fruitful partnership with Surinder Vassal, uh, an Indian person that worked with her uh, and did the scientific work that made a huge contribution to the world. So maize, it is a staple food in many developing countries, and it is deficient in the amino acids of lysine and tritophan, which are key protein building blocks. So this means that the people whose diets depend heavily on maize without access to more varied food are at risk of malnutrition. So they work uh, very hard and after countless hours in the laboratory, testing samples, sometimes even up to 25,000 samples a year, uh, their hard work culminated in the creation of the quality protein maize. Uh, they, it, it is called uh, or shorted as QPM, quality protein maize. And a grain of QPM features enhanced levels of lysine and tritophan. And the kernels, uh, they have the texture and the flavor that consumers like. It's very important also to say that this was achieved by conventional plant breeding and not by genetically modified organisms. Um, the QPM is commonly used as an ingredient in pig and poultry feeds, and QPM has been shown to enhance the animal growth and the health of the consumers. Uh, QPM has also shown to be particularly effective in improving the nutritional status of young children, uh, especially in developing countries from Latin America and Africa. Uh, Dr. Evangelina Villegas was, uh, well, she's the recipient of the World Food, World Food Prize in, from 2000, from the year 2000, and she's the first woman to ever receive this award. And in the same year, she received the award of Woman of the Year in Mexico. So this uh, today I wanted to share uh, with you a little, a little bit about Dr. Evangelina Villegas because I think that she's a very good example of how science uh, it's meant to benefit humankind. So, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Javier. That was very nice. Uh, next, we have Christian Peco uh, on Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Okay, hello, everybody. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so I brought uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, uh, not just uh, because of his important contribution, but also because 
I, I really find uh, some aspects uh, of his life very curious and, and inspiring uh, for me. So in the next slide, uh, his life is going to start in uh, Petilla de Aragon, 1852, northern Spain. And uh, his childhood is interesting because his father was uh, like uh, very interested in him in being like uh, passionate about science, but the little the little Santiago would be much more uh, like interested in drawing. For example, you can see there like those are like uh, when he was like a teenager. Uh, he would also be like someone like very rebellious and uh, ingenious. For example, he would make like, a home can a homemade cannon and destroy the door and the orchard of the neighbor, right? So I always try to think, uh, I always like to think that uh, if he was living in this era, uh, he would author one of these uh, YouTube videos about how to make a potato cannon, right? This is the, the type of kid that he was. And then later he would be become uh, like interested in photography. And actually he would, got, he would uh, get like several awards uh, during his career for that. So he saw himself uh, more like an artist. The father was very stubborn, wanted him to, to make medicine. And then they reach a deal, right? The father would pay for some more formal classes of drawing, and he would go to Zaragoza in 1869 uh, to complete his uh, degree in medicine. This is what he did. Uh, so in the next slide, uh, so he finished. Uh, he went to, to Cuba. He enrolled in the, in the army, but he got like, a, uh, like ill very quickly. So he came back to Zaragoza, found a position, started to like a lot what he was doing, uh, obtained a PhD in Madrid in 1877. And from there, uh, his, uh, his career would be unstoppable. He would get an academic position in Valencia, 1883, and then finally in Barcelona. So it was in this time in Barcelona uh, when he got in, in contact uh, with a revolutionary technique developed by Golgi. So Golgi created something that is called La Reazione Nera, uh, which is uh, translated as the Black Reaction, which uh, allowed uh, like uh, scientists to see, to isolate the structures in tissues that uh, before uh, they were indistinguishable, right? So uh, Cajal would embrace this technique and uh, then he would uh, observe and be obsessed with the nervous uh, system, the nervous tissue. So uh, he would, uh, so what happened there is that uh, his abilities drawing like became very handy. Because then at that time in the microscope, you could not uh, like, uh, like show very easily what you were seeing at the microscope, right? So then in his mind of genius, he would do something that they would call uh, artistic Z stack, right? So he would, he would look to these uh, like 2D uh, slides, make like a somehow like a three dimensional um, structure in his head, and then draw this with a, an outstanding level of, uh, of fidelity, as you can see there in, uh, in those, in those uh, comparisons, right? So in the next slide, we can see that during this time in Barcelona, and also during this time that he was uh, in Madrid, where he would got, get like the final position, he would uh, like uh, like show the world a lot of uh, like this uh, very nice drawings, uh, and then the outcome of all these uh, like uh, uh, very uh, very important activity in this field. In the next slide, uh, we would see that there would be the discovery of a very uh, a unit cell. Uh, uh, he would identify what we call the neuron, right? That was very important at that time because there was like a huge battle between the reticular theory, which was supported by Golgi himself, and uh, that said that the, the tissue, the nervous tissue was something continuous and the neural theory that stated that there had to be some sort of individual cell, right? Individual units that there were communicating. So uh, the work of Cajal uh, like made the neural theory prevail. This is why we remember him as the father of neuroscience. Uh, and actually without the concept of neuron, right? We would not have like the modern uh, neuroscience or even like more modern technologies that are based on that concept as neural networks in artificial intelligence. So in the next slide, I wanted to show you that uh, after this, he got like, a, of course, a lot of, uh, of awards. Uh, so he got the Helmholtz medal in 1905, which at the time was even regarded even like more important as the, uh, as, uh, than the Nobel. Uh, he got also a Nobel Prize shared with Golgi in 1906. And uh, if you happen to like be uh, like visiting Spain, well, you like walk in the cities and enjoy the architecture or the good food. So you will find uh, yourselves looking at a lot of monuments, uh, streets, uh, squares, uh, daily objects, uh, which are like a uh, name uh, after him, right? Even the most uh, important uh, fellowship um, system in Spain for getting like talent back to the country is named after uh, Santiago Ramón y Cajal. The last thing that I wanted to mention uh, is his, uh, his facet as a writer, right? As an author of books. He wrote like several general uh, science books. And I'm very fond in particular of one that I really enjoyed in my PhD and I would recommend any PhD like uh, listening to this. It's called Advice for a Young Investigator. 
And this is a, like a very interesting book. He's very bold in saying what is good science, what is bad, uh, what is good science, what is bad science. And uh, I wanted to read this uh, excerpt uh, to, to finish because I think it, uh, it shows how close to the daily activity uh, his uh, writing was and also I think showcases uh, the literary skills of, uh, I think, a very, very uh, complete individual. So it says, uh, if a solution fails to appear, and yet we feel that success is just around the corner, try resting for a while. Like the early morning frost, this intellectual refreshment withers the parasitic and nasty vegetation that smoothers the good seed. Bursting forth at last is the flower of truth. So I hope then you enjoyed that you read this book. Uh, thank you very much. That's lovely advice. Thank you so much, Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, I really learned something there. Uh, our next speaker is Leonard uh, Jacques uh, on Adriana Ocampo. Hello. Uh, my presentation is on Adriana Ocampo. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, the two flags that we saw were for Colombia and Argentina. Adriana Ocampo was born in Barranquilla, Colombia, and raised in Argentina. Uh, she dreamed of becoming a, a planetary scientist. She even uh, dreamed of making uh, space colonies and uh, tried designing them. The next slide, please. Um, the first things, one of the first things she said when she came to the USA is where is NASA? Uh, she worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in high school uh, beginning after her junior year. And then she studied uh, her bachelor's of science in geology at California State University and also a master's in planetary science at uh, California State University. She then went to uh, study her PhD in planetary science from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, one of her biggest discoveries was the uh, Shiksulu impact crater. Uh, which she did her uh, master's thesis and her PhD thesis on. So this uh, crater is the impact crater, which is believed to have uh, been formed by the, the uh, meteor that hit the earth around 65 to 66 million years ago and wiped out 50% of the species on this earth. Um, so including the dinosaurs. Then um, this, this uh, uh, impact crater was discovered around 1990 by Adriana Ocampo and she led six expeditions to the Yucatan province to investigate this impact crater and discovered that this crater is buried under about a, uh, a nearly a kilometer of sediments. Uh, next slide. Uh, currently, she is a NASA executive for New Frontiers uh, working on missions to Mars and also missions to Jupiter. And uh, she received the 2016 National Hispanic Scientist of the Year Award. Thank you. Very inspiring, Leonard. Thank you so much. And lovely slides there. Uh, the last two uh, talks, Wilson Yanis uh, is going to tell us about Juan Maldacena. Okay, hello. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Wilson Yanes and I'm going to talk about Juan Maldacena. He's an Argentinian physicist. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so Juan Maldacena was born on 1968 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he actually obtained his uh, Bachelor of Science in Physics at the Instituto Balseiro in Bariloche, Argentina, which you can see is a really cool place. Uh, next slide. Uh, after obtaining uh, his undergrad degree, he went on to Princeton to obtain his PhD. And his dissertation was really interesting. It was, uh, the title of it was actually Black Holes in String Theory. Uh, and after that, he has joined a lot of institutions. He has been a postdoc in Rogers and then faculty in Harvard, later to join the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where he now is a professor of theoretical physics. Next slide. Uh, his main contribution to physics is actually the ADS CFT correspondence, uh, which is quite cool. Basically, it says that certain theories of quantum gravity and the string theory that use anti-de-sitter spaces are equivalent 
to quantum field theories or conformal field theories that actually describe elementary particles uh, in one fewer dimensions. Uh, and this is really, really interesting because first it provides an unperturbative formulation of a string theory, and also it's a realization of the holographic principle. Basically, it means that if we study a string theory, uh, we can also study uh, particle physics in a space that is one dimension less than the original space. Uh, next slide. Uh, and he is a really, really prolific researcher. Uh, his paper actually, uh, the large and limit of superconformal field theories and supergravity is the most cited paper in high energy physics with more than 20,000 citations after today. Uh, he has won several prizes, including the Dirac Medal, the Albert Einstein Medal, and the Lawrence Medal, and the Fundamental Physics Prize. And is regarded by other theoretical physicists like Leonard Susskind as the greatest theoretical physicist of his generation. Thanks. Thank you, Wilson. Um, the, uh, I'm, I am the final speaker. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to uh, talk about Enrique Lodel Palumbo and uh, continuing the theme of uh, 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 Hispanic and Latinx scientists who have contributed so much to space and space research. Uh, Palumbo is considered the Einstein of Uruguay, um, as, as the panel on the left shows. Uh, he was born in Uruguay. He, uh, uh, moved, he, he st did his high school and studies there, and he moved to La Plata, uh, where he was a professor at University of uh, La Plata, Argentina, until 1962. Um, and here is some of his writings. Uh, that's, uh, some excerpts from there uh, are given below. His mother was uh, 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 a big inspiration for him. She, um, as, as, as you can see from the first two quotes, my mother was the first teacher in a rural, small rural school that she directed between 1901 and 1912. She introduced him to physics and cosmology. As you can see, his love for physics was very early. He considers Newtonian mechanics and Einstein's theory of relativity to be the greatest uh, works of humankind. Um, he was also a poet, as I'll tell you later, and um, he met his wife, and he was uh, uh, he had a lovely personal life as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is his Wikipedia page. I'm just pulling out a couple of things that uh, uh, struck me. Uh, first is that he met uh, Einstein, visited Argentina in 1925. He met him, and after that, um, he wrote his first paper. Uh, it is claimed that this is the first research paper on relativity ever published by a Latin American scientist. He also wrote two books, uh, both of which are well known, one on relativistic physics and other on teaching physics. And as material scientists, we might appreciate that he worked on sugarcane. That was his thesis, optical and electrical constants of sugarcane. Uh, so that has particular resonance to me. I'm a material scientist working on optical properties. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I have a very brief uh, uh, introduction here to what he did. On the left is the conventional view of space time, X is space, T is time. And the gray arrows there are somebody who is stationary and the blue arrows are for somebody who is moving at in an inertial frame at constant speed to the, gray per, uh, the person in the gray frame. And the speed is given above, and you can see how somebody, if somebody is moving in a rocket ship at different speeds relative to the, the person on the ground, their axis kind of, uh, you know, tilts and bends. Uh, it, it's shearing, uh, as we would we, uh, call it. It's not really a rotation. If you think of it as rotation, they are hyperbolic rotations. So this whole relativity field, uh, involves hyperbolic geometry. Whereas what you will hear about uh, as Lodel being famous for is um, using Euclidean angles to represent special relativity. And on the right-hand side, you can see 
that there are two right angles shown, one in red and one in gray, uh, between the, a blue space axis and a black uh, uh, time axis or a blue time axis and a black space axis. This is sort of a construction that uh, Enrique Lodl is known for. You're getting closer to Euclidean kind of geometrical representation of something that is not Euclidean. Space time is not Euclidean. Next slide, please. Now, I, there is a reason I picked him because this work so fascinated me. I uh, work, have been reading and thinking about it for the last four years. There is a paper that I, I recently published in 2021. The figures on the bottom left is Minkowski diagram, middle is Lodel diagram. And the, you can see it's still hyperbolic, but the angles are Euclidean. Um, I uh, propose something that builds on Lodel's diagram. It's really Lodel's idea. Uh, I just added one more thing where it turns all those hyperbolas into a circle. So now not only the angles are Euclidean, but the distances are Euclidean. And um, I believe there is a lot to it uh, and there is a lot more to be investigated. Um, so I'm very inspired and, and, and uh, inspired me to look into Lodl's uh, life. Next, next slide, please. He was also a poet. He uh, 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 attributed his uh, uh, book on poetry when he was at La Plata to Niels Bohr, as you can see on the left. Here's a very nice poem that uh, struck me as bringing together opposites. We often think of opposites as irreconcilable, whereas you can see uh, um, that in this poem, he brings them like yin and yang. Uh, um, let me read that uh, reasonably quickly. A fairy taught me one day what I cannot express, the sadness of joy, the joy of sorrow. And it made me perceive the static in the flow, the timber of the colors and the color of the sounds what the flowers talk about, the secret of the nest. I could glimpse from the blue art of living, the illogicality of thinking and the charm of feeling, the ephemeral of the eternal and the eternal of the fleeting, the infinite of the internal, the nothingness of the rest. Now, remember this is a, a poem in Spanish and it's an English translation. So I'm sure there's something lost in translation, but. It's a beautiful poem. With that, um, I think we have reached the end of our program. I am personally very inspired and I have learned so much. And I thank all of the speakers and all of those who have been listening um, for uh, coming to this uh, celebration uh, of Hispanic culture. And hopefully we'll do more of these again in the future. Thank you.